I now invite Dr. Aditya Sondi uh, to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, Professor Sheila Jasanoff, and to chair the session. Dr. Aditya Sondi is a senior advocate practicing before the Supreme Court of India and the High Court of Karnataka, and he has served as the additional advocate general for Karnataka. He is a graduate of NLSIU and holds a PhD in political science from Mysore University. Welcome, Dr. Sondi. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Justice Krishna Bhatt, whom I admire, Dr. Vandana Shiva, and many esteemed friends from Bangalore who are fighting the good fight. Before I introduce the distinguished speaker, let me genuinely say how honored I am to be asked to invite this session. Um, ESG is a Bangalore institution. And that, that, for me, is a double celebration, apart from the excellent work that you've seen it do. I think as a city, we feel proud of those who've uh, fought the good fight. And in some ways, ESG is an institution that was ahead of its times, because today, climate change is a sort of a default concept. But 25 years ago, perhaps not. And to be able to have uh, envisaged the challenges that the city and the larger ecology would face, I think, is commendable. And I, therefore, congratulate ESG and wish it the very best. I have had the pleasure of, in fact, being in some litigations against Leo and his team. Maybe that's why today's topic is common ground. And there is obviously common ground. Uh, Mr. Ramesh, in fact, uh, spoke of his experience as the environment minister and I represented and continue to represent in some cases the National Di uh, Biodiversity Authority. And uh, of course, <clears throat> I would think that we were all approaching environmental protection from perhaps slightly different directions. But that said, I must say that uh, Leo's efforts, ESG's efforts have always been honest. In court, PILs are more misused than used. But I can say with some certainty that the matters that ESG has brought to court have always been bona fide. And you would have seen in the course of the, uh, the film how often they have been accepted with alacrity by the courts in recognition of that work. <clears throat> Coming to the speaker for today, I looked up the CV of Professor Sheila Jasanoff. It's 22 pages long, which tells you what a formidable scholar she is. She is the Forzheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the JFK School of Government at Harvard University. At Harvard, she founded the Kennedy School's program on science, technology, and society. She also founded the Science and Democracy Network, which fosters uh, scholarship in the interface between science, technology, law, and political power. Indeed, uh, her research centers on these intersections of law, science, technology, and politics, subjects that we can barely even get our minds around independently. And she is concerned with the construction of public reason, something that I think should resonate with all of us. Our constitution speaks of a fundamental duty to develop a scientific temper and reason. Uh, ironically, we find that rationalists are victimized for thinking rationally. She has written more than 120 articles and book chapters on these topics and also authored and edited more than 15 books on the subject, which include her book, Science at the Bar, Law, Science, and Technology in America, which received the Don K. Price for the best book on science and politics. She holds an AB in mathematics from Harvard, an MA in linguistics from the University of Bonn, a PhD in linguistics from Harvard, and a JD, again, from the Harvard Law School. She has been visiting professor at a number of universities, including Yale, Boston, MIT. She is a visiting scholar at the Wolfson College, Oxford University, and a life member of the Clare Hall University of Cambridge. 
I was interested to find that uh, she was admitted to the Massachusetts Bar in 1977 and in fact spent a couple of years at an environmental law firm before veering into academia. She received a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship in 2010 and the Austrian government's Aaron Cruz for service to arts and sciences in 2008. Most significantly, last year in 2022, she received the Holberg Prize for groundbreaking research in science and technology studies. I think many of us know that is the Nobel for the social sciences. I'm most interested uh, to listen to Professor Jasanoff this evening and will take the liberty of responding to her speech afterwards. But I do want to say that technology and politics have historically always been, in a sense, in conflict. Some have had an aversion to technology, those who've had political power, and some have had too much of an affiliation with technology. And today, technology has resulted in propaganda, in technology running away with things, as it were, with the law trying to catch up with AI, with crypto, or for that matter, with the concepts of industrial development and climate change. The topic is most interesting. I again want to commend ESG. This could have easily been just a nostalgia evening. But that nostalgia section is over. And I think it is to the credit of the trustees and the organizers that the topic is forward-looking, imagining futures. And imagining futures in the context of the minefields of ideology that we today face, minefields of politics. I think our shared nations share these many minefields, but we also share our imaginations. And therefore, I think the speech that we're going to hear this evening from Professor Jasanoff becomes critically important. Her approach is interdisciplinary. Uh, no study today can stand alone. Science uh, is not the echo chamber in isolation that it used to be. There is no mathematics without art. There is no physics without music. But importantly, I think from Professor Jasanoff's perspective, she will bring to this topic a certain rigor and scholarship. When we speak of common ground, we don't speak of common ground simply as a via media, but we speak of it as a constitutional and an equitable common ground that appeals to all our good senses. These futures that we speak of today that are being imagined and reimagined include reimagining our own constitution. Some would say for the better, some would say for uh, the dreadful worse. And it is in these minefields of conflicts that we today are to receive a lecture on the common ground. And I thank you, therefore, once again for inviting me to chair this session and hand the floor over to Professor Jasanoff. Thank you. So you've already heard something said about two of the most persuasive people on the planet. Uh, they're so persuasive that they uh, essentially caused my gravitational field to change so that I added uh, what is it, 10 extra hours to my journey between Delhi and Boston uh, and uh, agreed to speak on a topic that Leo handed to me. Uh, so it's, uh, while you were very kind to say that the topic follows in a sense from my work, it's much more that when Leo orders, you listen. And uh, that is uh, why I'm here today, but I'm here today also, obviously, in a spirit of being enormously honored to offer a keynote address on this occasion. ESG has been a source of learning for me, so much so that I've been sending my students to become interns and work with Leo and Bhargavi. And over the last couple of years, I've had the good fortune of being able to work closely with them both on a number of projects that are in fact forward-looking and relate to transitions to sustainability and how we're going to come out of the different kinds of crises that we find ourselves in today. I don't know whether there is a common ground, but the, the question is more, how does one even begin to contemplate such a thing? And uh, it was a challenge. It was a challenge being given this topic and being told 
you know, it's like a, a university entering exercise or exam. You're given a question and you have to think of an answer no matter what. Um, and so uh, let me do my best. Could we go back, though? I, yeah. Um, okay, so the 25th anniversary. I mean, it is... Uh, an extraordinary thing for a civil society organization that is in the work of resistance and has maintained its smallness as well as its integrity to be coming to this point and to be attracting people of the sort that are represented here. So people from who are community leaders, people who are government leaders from all of the branches of government. And before we came into this room, we heard from the judicial branch and from the legislative branch and from others as well, uh, and also the occasional stray academic, um, not to mention uh, the cream of the cream of activism represented by people like Dr. Vandana Shiva in this audience. So it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be able to speak at an occasion like this and to be part of the tribute to the kind of human capital, the human energy, and the human vision uh, that has enabled an organization like ESG to continue to do that work of compassionate resistance, or however we want to think about it. So we're all familiar with uh, a moment that's often taken as a historic moment because it made everybody on Earth with access to visual imagery see and think about the planet for the first time, and this is through those famous pictures that the Apollo missions took of the Earth and brought back, and one of them, the left-hand one in particular, which became the inspiration for the idea of the pale blue dot or the blue marble, uh, has come to symbolize our togetherness on the Earth. It's something that inspired the development of our common future, that report that has already been alluded to. But today, we all agree, certainly in this room, but I think many billions of people elsewhere as well, that that planet is no longer this incredibly beautiful, suspended blue object in space that's wreathed in clouds and looks like a creation out of an artist's imagination. Um, and if, if you, in fact, type in words like environment and crisis, you're likely to get one of the elements that was already spoken of by Mother Bhushan, namely fire, overwhelming the more watery and spatial and starry quality of the planet. So that right-hand image is something that we are, I think, all psychologically familiar with. And in a sense, it symbolizes a change that has come over the Earth in the, in the past 50 years. Um, and speaks, I think, to that minefield, Leo, that you put into the title, uh, because the separations are not only, the separation between the blue and the red, are not only because of the environment in crisis, but because we seem to have stepped backward. I mean, so I myself was born just at around the dawn of the Indian independence, and there was a hope then, and then again in 1990 when the Cold War supposedly ended, there was another sort of spring of hope, but this is already now going on to 35 years ago, and if you look around the world today, as I was mentioning yesterday in another talk, The Guardian reminds us every single day of which day of the Russia-Ukraine war it is, and you know, Ukraine in my album of images before figured more as the site of Chernobyl. So there's a kind of uh, almost a sort of logic of recurrence that these battles are indeed continuing. And we're far from being in a place where the image of the planet Earth is a symbol of unification. Rather, there is a question, how can we possibly unify ourselves on a planet where the population is growing, the resources are decreasing, and the divisions between the rich and the poor are greater than, or the richest and the poorest is greater than at any previous time in history. In fact, when you type in things like to Google, I haven't yet done it with chatbot, and ask, you know, 
who is Bezos richer than or who is Musk richer than, they dig into mythology and come up with figures like Croesus. So, you know, it's almost like humankind has not known, you know, what this kind of accumulation of wealth in a few hands could be about. So these are all part of the minefield in which a resistance-oriented advocacy protest organization invites me to talk about finding common ground. Well, you begin to understand why this was a tall order. All right, so let's turn to the rigor side of things and sort of talk about some of the analytic ways in which people have tried to deal with this. So next slide, please. So there's history. Uh, we have for a long time been celebrating a thing called Earth Day. It began in 1970, and it has a date attached to it. Uh, I can't be sure, but I had the impression that this year, at least in America, more was made of this occasion than I've seen in the newspapers and even in sort of Harvard student activities. The students this year actually declared an entire week around Earth Day. So maybe there's something happening. But there's something else that I wanted you to see about this picture, which comes from the original Earth Day. Uh, some of the symbolism will be familiar even from this national government's activities because it was a sweeping the streets day. Um, people were cleaning up and litter was very much one of the things that was on people's minds then. But they're young people. <coughs> and in a sense, if you're talking about imagining the future, what better place to start than with the young people? And you find all around the world today, young people's movements springing up. So the face of the environmental movement today is a lot younger than I think the average in this room. And that is a, a sign of hope. And I took these pictures purposefully from different parts of the world. So you see Germany where the Fridays for Future movement got launched to some extent. Um, but you see that it has gone to other places as well, including India up there on the top left. And then you see legal decisions that young people are fostering. So you see the, the right-hand top picture uh, being um, from people who advocated for the Juliana case, which was a case brought by young people to force the, the US government to take action on climate change. I mean, thus far, that litigation has not produced positive results, but I'll come back to that in a short while. So at, when I was preparing my talk, I thought, you know, Leo, it would serve you right if I just stopped there, because uh, what do I have to say about it? The people in whose hands the future rests are already saying it. They're mobilizing all around the world. They seem sort of innocent of ideology, except in the sense that they stand for the ideology of the earth themselves. And what can we add to it other than cheer them on and provide the support that is the S of ESG and let them go for it? Um, but of course, we are some of us teachers, and we have seen the good energy along with the with the forgetfulness and the carelessness of the very young. So maybe there is something more to say beyond just noting that we are not alone, that there are lots of people around the world today taking the future, imagining it into their own hands. And to some degree, they are uh, willfully igno ignoring the divisions and the, the um, minefields uh, that many of us are all too well aware of. So how did we get over minefields in the past? There was this thing called an age of enlightenment, and people thought that enlightenment came to everybody equally. And what was this enlightenment going to be? It was going to be the enlightenment that comes of knowing our world better, doing the science, and you know, some of the eminent people in this room got there grounding in the sciences. I myself studied mathematics. It was probably not the wisest choice for me, but maybe I wouldn't have been the same kind of scholar if I hadn't had that early exposure to mathematics. It's a, it's a counterfactual, and we'll never know. But the idea was that once we learn to see the Earth as it is, we would, of course, all fall in line. There was no such idea as denialism 
uh, not even skepticism back when people were talking about the Enlightenment. And the notion that science is a universal and can bring people together was very much in the minds of many people, and it still is. This is, of course, you would expect this to come from no other country than France. And the French Academy of Sciences apparently believes in the universalism of the sciences and has an entire project dedicated to the universalism of the sciences, and it's featuring three thinkers. Uh, I'm uh, interested that they're all men, uh, and they all come from the worlds of the sciences. But one interesting thing is that they come from sciences that have a lot to do with the environment. So the life sciences in the case of Pasteur, and in the other two, the earth sciences, and also science in the service of the environment. So even in a country that still believes in a kind of rationalism that can be universal, there is this notion that the kinds of sciences you have to turn to are the sciences of the earth and of nature and of life. So that, I thought, was um, an interesting little commentary, even in the high citadels of universalizing scientific rationality. But for many of us who have worked with environmental matters, the truth is a lot more complicated than this picture would seem to suggest. When you start learning history of science, uh, somewhere along the way you get exposed to Thomas Kuhn. And Thomas Kuhn certainly coined one of the most cited and widely used and misused words in the English language that have to do with science and technology, and that is paradigm. So Kuhn's big insight was that normal science, as he called it, operates inside of paradigms. And those paradigms, even if you step away from the idea of totalizing universalism, nevertheless, the paradigmatic character of science gives it a kind of stability and an ability to cross boundaries and avoid minefields. So normal science happens within established theoretical frameworks, Around it are gathered communities of researchers who are held together by a set of beliefs that allow them to operate as if they are of one mind about what questions to ask and how to approach those questions. They use shared Im instruments, agree on methods. They turn to each other for peer review to validate the findings and put them on a more stable footing and they have recognized channels for publishing and the possibility of replicating each other's results. So for instance, when the strong claim broke a number of decades ago already that somebody had perfected a method of cold fusion, uh, something that was always in people's mindset but has never been achieved, very quickly physics departments all around the US tried replicating those efforts, couldn't replicate it, and it went down in history as one of these sort of sudden bursts of optimism that had no business being inside the halls of science. But this could only be done because there was a peer community that knew and agreed how a radical claim should be tested, and it went forward in that way. When you turn to the environmental sciences, you are no longer in the world of paradigms. So you're no longer in the world of neatness, of cleanness, of established peers. Rather, you're out there in a boat on storm-tossed waters, and you lack directional signals. Uh, maybe it's a little bit like the way my husband and I felt in the middle of March when we got into the north of Cyprus and were abandoned by Google. Uh, not knowing where the international border was, and it was very dark. So something about being in the environmental sciences is a little bit like that failure of the support system, and this is where the technology uh, abandons you, and you don't know where, where to go next. So in the non-paradigmatic area of the environment, the causal models are not so clear. One doesn't know in the huge complexity of possible factors that could be contributing to the things that have been noticed, what to foreground and what not. I mean, so even something that is so widely agreed upon as climate change, it took a long time to decide that this was not simply geological time functioning in certain ways and an aberration that was within the framework of probabilistic 
ranges, but rather that the connection to human activity was too strong to ignore. And even then, today, it's not the case that 100% of the Earth sciences agree on this. There are, for instance, in America, people who do meteorology, they're not unscientific people, but they have a hard time believing, they have an easier time believing perturbations in weather from day to day than climate change over eons. So, you know, these are things that one has to take into account when one begins to understand why the universalism of science no longer operates in that mutually enlightening, drawing us all together way that it was expected to do. And then the boundaries of the science are completely unclear. I mean, who are the peers? How are they guarding the doors? Uh, what happens when the products of science get out and do things? And, you know, all you have to do is look at the history of chemicals, many widely used chemicals today, to recognize that many of the disputes around the effects of these chemicals relate to the very uncertain boundaries about, you know, uh, models of how did the pathways work and, and what even counts as a cause and effect relationship. So against that backdrop, what we have seen is the rise of a different kind of expertise, not expertise contained within the halls of paradigmatic science, but the kind of expertise that this room represents and that civil society groups have been able to gather together to some extent. And so what I want to spend the bulk of the rest of my talk on is talking about where there could be universalisms, because I take the yearning for a bridging of the divide across minefields, the finding of common ground, to be about a search for universals in a sense. And I mean universals in the sense of aspiration, not in the sense of accomplished fact. We don't all have to come together and agree that this is the case. After all, if some people in this room believed that Mr. Jaram Ramesh was a spokesperson for Monsanto, but if he is capable of coming here today and holding hands with us, and, and I was honored to be in the company again with him, then there is a, a promise, and even the distinguished chair of this session has said that he and Leo have not always found themselves on the same side of the boundary. So it's in that sense that I want to talk about an aspirational universalism in which it is possible to at least be in the same room and talk about the same thing and feel that at the end of the day, some of the purposes around which we wish to gather are the same purposes. This is, in a way, the jumping off point. So it's not only that sciences have splintered, have become more complex. The systems we want to try to study and understand are very complex, but along with that has come a fracturing of the authority. So it's been, it was fashionable around the turn of the century in Science and Technology Studies, or STS, to talk about mode two of the production of science. Mode one was the kind of science that Kuhn was talking about with its purity, its basis largely in universities. But people said that mode two of scientific knowledge production has to recognize that science today crosses disciplines, crosses institutions, is no longer located only in universities. In fact, in America now, more than half of funded research is actually funded by private sector entities. So that line has been crossed. The federal government no longer funds as much as 50% of basic science. So you know, the, the question of whose knowledge is it and how um, detached is it from private interest has taken on new meaning in the world that we're in. And it's not only that people with interests are producing knowledge, it's also that the relative power of those groups producing knowledge and those groups who are forced to live with the results of the knowledge uh, is is uneven. So employees have always had access, um, employers have always had more access to information about their employees, including their health and safety, than the reverse. And today in the era of datafication and big data, those problems are even exacerbated. And in those examples that I've laid out, like Bhopal and Union Carbide, Chernobyl and the Soviet state, 
and Fukushima and TEPCO, there was also an involvement of governmental bodies in ensuring and underwriting those discrepancies of power, and that exists still today. And the technologies that states have evolved to know and understand things, to some degree keep alive the imbalances of power. States look at us, nation states look at us in ways that we're not always capable of seeing ourselves or looking back at them. So the first universalism that I want to talk about that civil society can bring to the table and organizations like this one that we're celebrating today is the universalism of experience. So this is not the universalism of detachment. This is the universalism of actually living in the way that people live on the ground. These are the community leaders who are in the room today. Let's go on. So. I often talk about this quotation because to me it encapsulates a lot of what is meant by the discrepancy between expertise on the one hand and experience on the other. This is an anonymous spokesperson who spoke back to the Brundtland Commission during the preparation of the Our Common Future report. And he was very, well, I don't know, he, that person was very skeptical of what the commission was doing because even the words that the commission was using seemed to leave aside common people's experience. You talk too much about survival and you don't talk enough about life. And these people that still live in the Amazon region do not want to reach down to the level of survival. So it was rejecting a form of literally top-down knowledge in favor of a different form of knowledge and the form of knowledge that was being experienced is the form of knowledge that is associated with living a life, not merely observing it. So we are familiar, particularly in India, with people who have asserted that kind of knowledge and have been able to make headway. And it's worth remembering that these social movements, the Chipko movement in particular, has had the same kind of wide circulation as certain kinds of scientific statements about, say, climate change or whatever. So why is it that a CHIPCO movement can have the same kind of status? People know what it is. People know what it stands for. They know what kinds of actions were taken. They even have some idea, if they're environmentalists or in the environmental community, uh, why, uh, you know, what people were doing. The idea of tree hugging became a term in the English language, and it was certainly not what the people in Chipko themselves were using, in, uh, except as a symbolic statement. And the Center for Science and Environment, which, whose first citizens report uh, wonderfully printed so that the cover was upside down in relation to the text. I have a copy of this first edition of this report, and I quite treasure it as uh, a thing that indicates how it was a cottage industry, and yet it was a cottage industry that was able to grow and universalize itself and now features in any history of the Indian environmental scene. But its influence has reached, of course, much wider. There's the universalism of experience, which I'm suggesting can bring us together because it's on the ground and it is um, lived life showing the complexity for what it is. You don't have to have a social science of the women in Chipko separated from the biological science of the trees. They're interwoven. They're integrated together in a certain sense. But from that well of experience, one can also question the wisdom of expertise and the universalism of expertise. And I want to argue that expertise is a different thing from science. Expertise is something that builds on scientific knowledge but goes further because it exercises judgment in some ways. And as soon as experts exercise judgment, they're setting themselves up in another layer of society, the same layer that is occupied by the rulers, and therefore one has to ask, well, what is the accountability of these experts? And I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about how we as members of civil society can interrogate that expertise. And there is a universalism that comes from reasserting our right to ask certain kinds of questions of the would-be experts. In America, the expertise about planetary systems was always tied to 
Cold War and weapons type of manifestations. Uh, the name of Buckminster Fuller is very much associated with a planetary vision. And there was a coming together of a kind of geometrical view of environmental responses. I mean, this is the man who built and designed the geodesic dome, but together with the ideas of the spaceship. So Buckminster Fuller is famous for having authored um, a sort of guide for the pilots of spaceship Earth. And so there's very much the sense that when you imagine the Earth as a planet, you think of it as a vehicle in outer space, and then you have to imagine the people who are actually guiding this planet, uh, and it's a manual for spaceship Earth. Now, I think something of that idea infuses this sudden uh, familiarity and, and appeal of the word Anthropocene as it has taken off since the turn of the century. So I'm sure everybody here is aware that uh, geologists now are talking about a new era in Earth history, which is the era defined by the uses that we as a human species have made of the Earth. And the Anthropocene is the, is the term that is given to this era in which we're all living. So this is a way in which geologists and the geological sciences are universalizing the idea of the very sort of phases of the Earth that we're attached to. And the fact that the Anthropocene exists and planetary systems are understood as systems has given rise to very ambitious ideas about how science and technology can deal with all of the problems that we fa face. And probably the most ambitious of these at the moment is the idea of geoengineering in whatever form it takes. And geoengineering is um, supposed to allow us to guard on a planetary scale against the destructive forces that are let loose on the world. But this um, extract of a quotation from the anthropologist Joseph Masco uh, suggests that, that we have to look at the sort of presumptions that underlie the systemic assumptions about the Anthropocene, namely that there is a kind of universal infrastructure upon which we can build our geoengineering models. Turning to the sociology and philosophy of knowledge, one finds that there are two very different approaches to thinking about what the role of human beings and of civil society should be in the face of these new ways of characterizing the world as planetary systems, as computerized systems, as spaceships, as things that we can be directing by using a manual. So two, two, <coughs> two European thinkers who have written about this uh, both now sadly no longer with us, were Bruno Latour and Ulrich Beck. And if you look at what Bruno Latour had to say, he embraced the idea that these things that we have created, these technologies, are things that we should grab onto and celebrate and, and uh, uh, not fear that we should take control of them. So today we can fold ourselves into the molecular machinery a very a uh, celebratory statement of what modern biology can do. Of soil bacteria, through our sciences and technologies, we run robots on Mars. That's surely a celebration of Mr. Musk. We photograph and dream of further galaxies, and yet we fear that the climate could destroy us. So his precepts were that we should not fear. Rather, as he said in another of his essays, we should love our monsters, embrace them, and try to live with them. Whereas Ulrich Beck, as a sociologist, was more thinking about the societies that have been created in this fashion. And he says, in matters of risk, or he said, in matters of risk, we have been disenfranchised. So this is far from the confidence of a Bruno Latour that we, the citizens, have lost sovereignty. So I think that the Beck formulation of the world rings true to many people who see the promises of technology and think, for instance, of the Mangalore airport disaster that that little film showed us and how 
Many people could have predicted something, but nevertheless, the technological hubris ran away with things until the disaster happened. And I think that the universalism of questioning expertise is about how we, as citizens, can stop feeling disenfranchised and actually learn to recover our lost sovereignty. Now, this is particularly significant because today we are guided in the environment by all kinds of goals and all kinds of indicators that tend to be defined from the top down. And this is a familiar image, I'm sure, to most people here, the sustainable development goals. So how else can we think about these sustainable development goals if we adopt the questioning universalism that says expertise is something not just to be accepted at face value, but to turn the lens around on expertise and ask questions about it? So one question is, where are we standing, whoever the we is, when we bring those questions into being? Um, the right-hand image is one that I took in Calcutta just, or Golgotha, in just the last few months. Uh, and the left-hand image is from a street in Oslo. Uh, so depending where you are, I mean, you know, arguably the picture on the right shows a more sustainable mode of transport because it's not generating a great deal of carbon. It's using up a lot of energy. But is that the world we want? And in any case, which is the right ba baseline from which to calculate globally where the world should be going? Um, and you may recognize the figure in the right-hand image there. Uh, so not just from what baseline, but what is the purpose? What are the purposes of these technologies that are being evolved? And on the left is this artificial ocean of Pavagada, the at the, at the time we visited, right before the pandemic, the second largest solar park in India, I think you said. Um, but then when we drove into a nearby, nearby village, they were at first quite critical of these people who had suddenly landed in their SUV, and they criticized us for having essentially destroyed their world, destroyed their futures, because there was no farming possibility left. And even though the farming had been very uncertain, for some of these people, the returns they were getting from having invested their small amount of soil into the solar power was not enough to keep body and soul together. And for the next generation, for the young people, it was absolutely not clear where they were going to go for jobs. Bangalore was quite far away, and there were no jobs to be had in the region. So they did become extremely welcoming when they discovered that we were not, in fact, the people who had landed the solar panels into the region. But, but it was a reminder, the, the sort of juxtaposition between these inert panels and the very much alive people was a reminder how little we ask about the purposes of technology as we go about installing them. And I think that, again, questioning the purposes is another way to regain the kind of lost sovereignty of the citizen that Ulrich Beck was talking about. And then the distributive impacts. I mean, this is something that I actually have a hard time understanding how one can go into technological development without asking all the time the question about who is this for? So why should the electricity go to coastal urban areas and the village that is immediately next to the dam be left to dark? I mean, these are kinds of phenomena that we see overall. And again, this is one of the most powerful citizens' movements that this country has generated. And it did actually have an impact. And it had an impact that caused entities like the World Bank to step back from the building of high dams. I mean, not that it stopped these developments for good, but I think this is this intervenes in that discussion we were having before the sessions began about is it a lost cause or is it a struggle that must continue? And I think I come down on the side of the struggle that continues rather than lost cause because when citizens speak with this kind of voice, things do happen. And that is something I remain persuaded of. We've talked a lot about law, and it's my field as well. And I think that law offers another way to do universals that science does not offer. And so this next universalism that I'd like to propose is one in which we 
go back to understanding law not simply as an agent of the market, something whose function is to make life safe for rich people exchanging goods, but as an instrument of social justice. And social justice, of course, is one of the norms that this organization stands for and all civil society groups stand for. So the next slide, please. Um, I was thinking about this before Mr. Ramesh mentioned it. In fact, I didn't know he was going to be here. But <laughs> this is a development that is, again, extremely significant. And it is a way of saying that one can find interstices in the law. One can even find institutions that should exist but did not exist. And the NGT legislation and the development is an example of that, that the environment demands its own kind of tribunal. And I've highlighted one of the sentences there, or at least the beginning of it, because shall provide speedy environmental justice was one of the prime functions. I mean, of course, one can write many cynical articles about whether it does it or doesn't do it. But nevertheless, one has to take account of the fact that for the environment to have a role in social justice and vice versa, it may be necessary to create a tranche of advocacy, a place of advocacy that will deliver something different from the kind of law and economics teaching that many of the best students in our law schools still think is the purpose of going to law school. So of course, thinking backward, we have to think what kinds of law schools will be serving these tribunals, but that may be another area where environmental organizations have a role to play. In American law, there's been uh, an opening up, but it's a troubled history. Right now, we are in a period of regress, as many people know. But this idea of standing was another of the crucial developments of law in relation to justice and the environment. Again, the point here in the development of standing law in the United States was a recognition that for the environment, for nature to have a role in our lives, there has to be some symbiotic relationship between who speaks for nature and what nature is. And so starting in the 1970s, there was a liberalization of so-called standing law about who can come in and on what grounds they can speak. And it's philosophically significant because standing previously had been linked to property and to economic purposes. And it was only in the 1970s that people began to recognize, judges on the Supreme Court, that standing could be for other reasons as well. And those reasons include aesthetic reasons and you know, um, conservation and recreation along with uh, the more standard, I own this property and you're interfering with my property rights in the system. So this became, to some degree, hardened into a legal test by the 1990s, showing that even the formalization of the law was actually recognizing an expanded state for uh, standing of citizens. And then uh, the last case, the 2021 of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, that's the one out on the West Coast, in a way retrenches and says that the plaintiffs in the Giuliano litigation, this is the youth movement litigation, trying to force the federal government, the Environmental Protection Agency, to act more firmly on climate change, that they lack standing. But I think, again, the important thing is to put the idea into circulation. And the win or the loss is not the immediate thing. It leaves the struggle open to be carried out again the next day and the next year. And it's not only happening in the US. So in French environmental law, this um, rather arcane um, proceeding by a small village has actually shaken the roots of constitutional law and environmental law, because this commune of Grand Sainte actually sued the French state because it was not fulfilling its obligations under the Paris Accord. And eventually, they got a judgment from the French Supreme Court saying that, indeed, the government should take all the measures necessary 
to bend the curve of greenhouse gas emissions to meet climate goals. And this was the very first time that the French Supreme Court had actually ordered the state to live up to positive obligations in relation to the law. So this was, again, one of these moments in which the law is being used not in a technocratic way, but in a way that actually changes the con constitutional relationship between the, the citizens and the state, because the citizens are making this demand on behalf of a municipality and its mayor. And then this one, where it's not yet obvious what exactly is going to happen, where the Peruvian farmer says that the glacial melt is going to flood the terrain, and the German high court actually sends experts in to study the situation. But the point is, wh who is suing whom where? This is a global lawsuit. It involves a global planetary level problem. And the, the uh, plaintiff says, I hope the judges and also the representatives of the energy company have recognized through their visit the constantly increasing risk in wh to which we are exposed here. The question for us is not whether a tidal wave is imminent, but when and how badly it will hit us. So the sheer fact that citizens are bringing these kinds of claims and they're being heard across continental divides and across oceans, and the law is moving, and is moving its own expertise around the world, I think that these are major manifestations about a reclamation of the territory of the law to serve environmental interests, creating a very different kind of universalism from the universalism of science, and it's much more the universalism of social justice. And then the last one I want to talk about is the universalism of memory and of storytelling. I think Everybody who is trained in law understands the importance of storytelling. People less well understand that science is also in the business of storytelling. But the stories that science tells are not always the same as the stories that history would tell or that people through their own folk tales and legends would tell. And in this country, of course, the 1984 Bhopal disaster, which is going to have its 50th um, 40th, I guess, anniversary next year, uh, is one of these parables. It's become universalized. You can say Bhopal and people will have a glimmering of an idea of what happened. But it was partly about keeping the memory alive, keeping the memory of injustice alive in a variety of different ways. There is this actual monument in Bhopal, which is perhaps not the most artistic thing anybody has ever seen. When I went, it was in 2004, I was struck more by the graffiti on the wall, which said Hang Anderson, um, suggesting it was a rather unforgiving memory. But nevertheless, it is a commemoration of a thing that happened that has itself circulated far and wide much more powerfully in a way than scientific knowledge circulates. Next slide. And even then, and maybe still, uh, on certain evenings, the survivors and their families would go out with candles and walk around in a procession and come to the central square and put the candles down. And it was a sort of exhibition almost in its way, a commemoration through enactment and reenactment, a ritual, a ritual of flames and light, which are part of the fabric of this country, which we're keeping alive an understanding of a set of relationships that must not be allowed to occur and recur again. And the commemoration happens, of course, in mediums that are not always tangible. So I was struck that in 2007, in the Racina's book, Animals, of Pe Animals People was shortlisted for one of the major literary prizes, the Man Booker Prize, because it was a statement that, like Chipko, like the Narmada movement, uh, Bhopal itself has become one of these circulating signifiers. It is something that has achieved a kind of universalizing status, and it has done so because of citizens claiming and reclaiming their sovereignty through multiple generations and saying, this is not a technological world 
that is tenable anymore. It has to be done differently. We could have a whole big discussion about what has happened now that Bayer has chosen to buy Monsanto and what some of the reverberations are because of that acquisition. But it is interesting that the that chemicals no longer move around the world with quite the same freedom that they used to before. And it's, again, a different kind of storytelling, a different kind of exercise of citizen sovereignty that has led us to this point. Next slide, please. And with that, I want to thank you, and I hope that we can carry that discussion of new universalisms forward. So thank you, Professor Jasanoff, for that magnificent lecture. It has left me with more questions than answers, which is always the sign of a good talk. I'm sure you have questions too, and I'm told we have about 15 to 20 minutes for an interaction. So I will uh, pass the floor on to you in a few minutes. But may I exercise the privilege of responding to this brilliant and wide uh, lecture this evening. Professor has spoken of equity or inequity and a sort of a balance or an imbalance of power that we see in all our societies. And raised a question perhaps whether science at all is the answer and whether the next generation or the youth in some way offer a better future than we have imagined. And I think that becomes a very interesting and a perplexing question because the intersection of youth and science is itself now a given. I think the exposure of science and technology with the current generation is exponentially higher than what any of us have seen. Does that mean that a better future is imagined? One that is more equitable or not, I think, is going to be a burning question. And I say that because science itself has its amoral side. I was intrigued to read on the flight yesterday from Delhi an article in the recent caravan about what is called the Bangalore effect, if you will. And it's not charitable at all. It speaks of the Bangalore effect in the context of technology. I, I hope I can be forgiven for saying this at the Infosys Science Foundation. It's not that I personally subscribe to this, but it's a perspective that the Bangalore effect today has come to mean a sort of an amoral engagement with science and development, where you contribute a, an, a classist, uh, technocratic model, heavily lopsided, focused on what we generally understand as economic development, but bereft of compassion and equity. And Professor Jasanoff also very interestingly, and I would say thankfully, referred to the role that uh, law schools might play in being feeders to a concept of environment, environmental and social justice. And this is again perhaps a Bangalore question to be asked. It has already been revealed in my introduction that I went to the National Law School, so I can't deny it. But is that NLU model also then feeding social justice, or is it feeding a certain elitism, I think is a question that at least I have been left with. What common ground then uh, can we find? Look at the, uh, the, the paradox when, uh, and this was a universal paradox, when it came to the question of vaccines during the COVID uh, disaster. And the world was divided between vaccine deniers and those who readily accepted the medical scientific solution to come out of this uh, pandemic. Where was the common ground in it? It was not then good enough if I took the vaccine, but someone else in my vicinity was a hater or a denier. The Supreme Court today is dealing with the question of same-sex marriages. What common ground do we have? Today there's no common ground even when it comes to the question of gender. If you look at the position that the union is taking and the position that the petitioners are taking, they are worlds apart. And what struck me the most, I think, from the talk this evening was the distinction between having a life 
and simply survival. I think that's a, a marvelous uh, and a very visceral approach. And that's very real to us today. When we speak of concepts of gender, of poverty, and I would say significantly of caste in India or race in the West, we cannot approach it from a condescending perspective where we're simply recognizing somebody's right to survive. If we are not elevating that to a right to live, a right to live a full life, as Justice Bhatt will endorse, a right that in Article 21 of our Constitution has been recognized to mean something more than base or bare survival, I think the conversation remains incomplete. And in that sense, therefore, I would say that more than aspiring for this common ground, perhaps it's time to look at new ground. A new ground which represents a, a universe, universality of uh, the, the positives, the compassion, the grace, and the hope that humankind have manifested historically. Environment and science are also universals in that sense. They are issues that everyone is dealing with today. Uh, an environmental issue in Bangalore is equally an environmental issue in South America and vice versa. And therefore, this new ground, as Rumi had said, meet me in a place which is neither good nor bad, to paraphrase, is perhaps what we need to look at. The law has a lot of catching up to do. Uh, more recently, we have seen judgments where rivers have been recognized as living beings. That is new ground. And that is universal ground that brings with it hope it brings with it questions of access, and I think it brings with it also important questions of influence. My friend Bablu is here, Bablu Ganguly, who runs the Timbuktu Collective, and I think he has shown that example, has shown that influence to begin with may be small, but it is real. And when you see change happening, what he's done, perhaps many of you know, is converted an arid sort of desert land into a lush green forest, along with which has come uh, all the elements of compassion, social empowerment, women's empowerment, cooperative movements, etc., which I think are markers of, of real change. So therefore, I conclude by saying that it's been a fascinating uh, lecture, a lot of food, of food for thought for us to, to carry back with us. And I thank you for this opportunity and open the floor to any questions. So thank you for your talk. And I guess I'm interested in thinking about these universalisms from one question about the, I guess, starting point for where the universalisms come from. So I thought something really illuminating that came out of the talk was thinking that the law itself actually came from an imagination of private property, that it was a kind of idea of a liberal economic subject, a kind of white male subject maybe, that kind of went around the world and colonized it with this thinking about economy. And then that becomes the world in which something like environmental law has to emerge to respond to it. So I'm just thinking that you know, in what Leo was saying, he saw something very similar happening in Bangalore, that as soon as you allow the instruments of such an imagination of law to take over as the starting point, then that becomes the imagination and not something like the green city, so or the garden city. So I'm, I'm wondering what you think about the other starting point. So something more like what the the man, um, the or the, I guess witness from Brazil, if that would have been the starting point for a different kind of universalism, and what you actually do with given the fact that the world is laden with um, these very powerful universalisms that we might want to disrupt and uh, compassionately resist, as I think many people have put it so far. Um, thanks for the question. I'm not sure whether this is a question. <clears throat> I mean, the law like science has presumptions built into it, and <clears throat> what we, you know, what the Indian Supreme Court will decide about same sex marriage has a lot to do with <clears throat> dominant understandings of. <coughs> who should marry whom. And these are not things that come out of nowhere. And we know that, at least in the Western context, the production of law is extremely closely tied to elite formation of all kinds. Um, the US Supreme Court, I think, at the moment has only one justice who is not trained at either Harvard or Yale. 
Yale Law School, and until recently, all nine of them were either from Harvard or Yale Law School. <clears throat> so the question of where alternative imaginations of the law would actually find ground to stand on, given the hold that the, um, the power of the law has on always already built in ideas about rights and responsibilities. I mean, that is a real question. But I think it's a broader question of interdisciplinarity. I mean, where, where is the critical faculty with, in relation to any discipline, be it law or be it earth and planetary science, where is that going to lodge and where is it going to find its place? It's obvious, I think, to a lot of people here that farmers' knowledge about what seeds are like and what's needed to make them grow <clears throat> doesn't as easily find research funding to propagate it as the latest greatest discovery of how to edit a genome of a staple plant that would give somebody a monopoly on a, on a very valuable kind of seed. So I think that once one takes the institutional levels into account as part of what needs to be reformed for purposes of social justice, then the challenge becomes both more focused in some ways, but also more difficult. I mean, this is why even, I mean, without knowing that Jerome Ramesh was going to bring up the question of the new green tribunals, um, I thought of that as a kind of example because it really is making a niche, making a space for a kind of jurisprudence which I was suggesting needs its upstream element. I mean, it, again, it's not enough just to form the institution. What kind of advocacy is going to work in it is also part of the question. But one of the things I've admired about ESG is that it actually doesn't seem to think that you have to be trained in law and have a credential in order to be able to pursue interesting lawsuits. In US law, or in the institutional context of US law, you can be a Supreme Court justice without holding a JD degree. It's um, since Earl Warren, I don't think there has been anybody appointed to the US Supreme Court who didn't have a JD. But there could be a movement to do that, to restore that kind of a, an imagination that is more societal, more complex, and more compassionate at the moment the person on the US Supreme Court who represents that kind of a viewpoint is probably Justice Sotomayor because of her particular um, ethnic and gender experiences. But one wishes for a more thorough kind of revolt and reform that actually even revitalizes potential that exists in constitutional theory. One doesn't always have to even go outside the Constitution. I think that the, the overall point for us to carry away is that these decentralized places where imagination has not necessarily been constrained by the standardization of the very successful uh, is itself, those are the labs, those are the places from which I think creative social justice initiatives can spring. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Jasanov, for a, a really um, imagining futures. Uh, a couple of thoughts came to my mind, and uh, one, one is the subject, imagining futures. One is the mention of World Earth Day, and the third is on the issue of living and survival. Here we are, some 200 odd members of Homo sapiens species talking about the survival or the life of 7.5 billion Homo sapiens. And uh, I don't know whether we are really addressing the futures of those other guys out there, excluding the 200 odd here. And uh, what future are we talking about uh, of those who are not, who don't even understand the uh, things which we are talking about here, uh, this really is 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 gotten to me, 
And uh, thank you very much for triggering this uh, in my mind. Thank you. I'll take that more as a comment than a question. But I think that we don't have to act like we're determining the future for the seven and a half or however many billion either. <coughs> it's more what resources to think with can we bring into the discussion. Um, so that, that's a quick response. Uh, thank you for the very scholarly presentation of a lot many ideas which are possibly now emerging. The basically picked up on these two words which you picked up, experience and expertise. The kind of world which was in the past, maybe partly we have lost now, has been the world of experiences. But uh, maybe the last 100, 200 years seems to be the age of the expertise, the age of the, the so-called specialization. And a few words one has just quickly picked up. The age of the experience possibly belongs to the uh, the locals, whereas the age of the expertise would belong to the, the universal scholars included. The age of the experience could be of the commoners, whereas the age of the expertise could be of the consultants. The age of the experience could be of simplicity, whereas the age of expertise could be of, spec of the specialization and speculation. But now anyway, now the, the concern here was, is it really still possible to speak of the age of the experience? Because the expertise uh, specialization seems to be all over. Universities are offering more and more. I'm just referring even to if you look at the Bangalore city, the Bangalore effect which <laughs> I was talking about. In the last 10 years, the, Indian, the Bangalore colleges and universities must have had at least 100 extra courses. The field I'm coming from architecture, I know how many new programs have been added for students come, they join the colleges. <coughs> so it's increasing. So where is the scope for the, the, expert, the experiences? Of course, you know, ESG honored some of the community leaders here. It's still here. I'm not saying it's not here, but aren't we losing this so fast? And aren't we giving too much of importance to the experts and the consultants, specializations included? So where does one really find or discover again the experience uh, or the age of experience again? <coughs> I wish I knew the answer. Um, the, um, you know, it, it gets a little sadder and more complicated in a, in a way or more intensified if you think about what the experts are experts in and why. So in the last few years, like five or six, many universities have decided to start new initiatives in climate. They didn't do it for environment. I mean, so even though Earth Day was in 1970, um, the major environmental legislation in America began, you know, back in around then, 1969 and so on, most universities did not treat environment as a crying issue, but now they treat climate as a crying issue. And you have to stop and ask why. And I think the answer is rather clear because people see that climate change, unless we quote, do something about it, unquote, will not let the very well-off people on the planet continue to live in the ways that they do. So climate has become a place of expertise. If you look at the kinds of people that are being <clears throat> hired into these climate positions, they're people who are energy experts, for instance. And why are they energy experts? Because they're imagining societies in which the demand for energy absolutely will rise and must rise. <clears throat> and I'm sure that everybody in developing countries is aware that the great fear of the rich countries is that when developing countries reach the same level of development as is average for these other countries, then the situation will be turned on its head and result in a tragedy of the commons for all. I mean, so not that there will be a common ground, but there will be a tragedy of the commons. So I think that the rise of the expert class is at the same time a rise in the defensiveness toward the status quo. There are not very many people who are specializing in how the sustainability of the village mud hut can be generalized. And made into the lifestyle of the rich and famous. 
the rich and famous are still building things like Trump Towers and, you know, uh, that, uh, which are not very energy intensive, I mean, sorry, very energy efficient to my knowledge. So, you know, it's, it's restoring experience means restoring the value of, of experience. And I'm sorry we didn't hear the entirety of the poem earlier this, this afternoon because one way in which one restores the beauty of experience is through these neglected fields of the humanities that are being stamped out at the same time as the rise of the experts. So I think it's a big problem. It's a problem that universities absolutely should be dealing with. But I think civil society should be dealing with it all the more. Because if you don't give people resources to speak in language, resources to think about the world with, like philosophy, resources to remember the world with, like history, uh, you know, what kinds of societies are we going to even begin to imagine? So I think of all my talks as being fundamental pleas for restoring a kind of humanism, even in the most technocratic spaces. And uh, I'm not in a university context where that's a popular position to take. Um, thank you, Professor Jasna, for a really spectacular lecture. Um, as always, it was really astounding the the number of sort of cultural and political backdrops you spoke through, and I, I I thought that it was, I mean, of course, very interesting to see the way in which science and technology, as you said, lands in these various contexts and how they're extremely contingent and culturally um, contextual. So while I understand the sort of structuring of science and technology and the way in which um, particular contexts take up science and technology is contingent on their history, um, political processes, etc. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about um, the sort of agency side of it. Uh, how do you see or sort of analyze the, the ways in which the, there's sort of a will, will for transformation and a will for change or a will for agency across these contexts also? Um, do you see them also as being structured by particular um, histories and politics? I'm, I'm curious about the sort of transformative, the, the will to transformation and the will to agency and how to think about that. Yeah, I mean, thank you. That's again a huge question. And Leo and Pargavi and I, along with a number of other colleagues, have been working for a few years on a project that was called transformations to sustainability. So, you know, how transformations can be made to happen and who the agents are and from whom new action can come and the kind of new, um, uh, new ground that you were envisioning can arise has been somewhat at the top of our minds. I think we have to rely on Leo to s set up a workshop soon to <clears throat> to discuss those issues in more detail. But I think that the, you know, sort of beginning of an answer is, um, <clears throat> you know, you were talking earlier about how uh, the digital entrepreneurs are talking about unlocking the potential of the country. People don't seem to think any more much about people doing literature or art or even philosophy unlocking minds. And I think that the first place to begin is by delineating the fact that alternatives exist. I mean, this is why much of my research has been comparative, because I want to show that even with the same hard object in the hand, it's possible to make something completely different out of it, aesthetically different, commercially different, and so on and so forth. I think the fact that we have the logo unveiling in a way speaks to that. I don't think I've ever been to a conference with a logo unveiling. Um, you know, it's, uh, so this is a famous first. Um, but I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a tribute to the fact that even something as commonplace as a logo can be made into a site of spiritual reflection. Now, supposing every idiot logo manufacturer in America were taught to rethink that this is a craft moment. It's not just a standardizing moment. If people could sort of relearn that 
designing software and is not just about speeding up that chatbot to be better than chat GPT or you know whatever, but <clears throat> that you know somehow in the relationship that you're building with the mechanical, you're also investing yourself. You're creating a sort of world in which you know, behind the veil is an interlocutor that you're making in your own image, and why? I mean, this is what the purposiveness is about. So I think, you know, going back to the function of this session and celebrating ESG's 25th anniversary, the, the thing for which I am most thankful for the existence of these organizations is precisely that they have not been, you know, uh, disciplined into the structuring capabilities of the science and technology, but remain unruly enough. I mean, you know, if Leo was bad news, then he's an even wiser and more knowledgeable bad news now. And one could say that of Bhargavi and probably all of the members of the board as well. So, you know, how to maintain that unruly, resistant, rebellious, and to some extent, therefore, more imaginative and free imagination, that's I think that's the most we can say about how to think about agency. Be outside the grid and not inside of it. Given that no system of government has ever done away with inequity, is it not inequity natural, given that people and populations are natural numbers and applying norms of a continuous variable statistically mislead analysis and diagnosis? I'm asking this question because you said you have got a mathematics background. My mathematics background was left behind when I graduated from college, and since that was at the age of 19, that's quite a long time ago. But setting the mathematical joke aside, um, you know, it depends on what one means by inequity. I don't think anybody thinks that we will produce a world in which everybody will have exactly the same quantum of every good that exists. It would be probably impossible to imagine it, and people would be changing things almost immediately so that they would have more and not less. I mean, you know, I'm sure that many people in this room have had little tugs of war with their nearest and dearest over the blanket on a cold night. I mean, so, you know, the the <clears throat> who who gets to wrap themselves up in what is, is always going to be a thing. The questions become ones of, you know, does everybody have enough for a satisfying life? I mean, for not merely survival, not bare survival, but to be able to develop one's potential. As you know, there's a great deal of philosophical attention that's been given to what those minima might be and how one might achieve it. I think people accept that if a floor is set and nobody is inhumanly below that floor, then you're in a relatively just society. I think people... So why do uh, humanities people ignore uh, the property of numbers? Certain things which show up when you collect data. Why is it just ignored? Well, I mean, that's a very sweeping statement, and I don't know that I can agree with it without understanding exactly what it means. And, you know, a lot of the time, numbers don't matter to people. I mean. Do I really care what exactly? Most most modern governments have huge departments of statistics and data collection and so forth. I don't think India's is any exception. Um, why do people make policies that seem to fly in the face of numbers? You could be asking that. And the usual answer that people give is it's politics because people want those things. I mean, so just to take one little example and leave it at that, America has gas prices that to all the so gasoline for cars that to the whole rest of the world appear to be irrational, irrationally low. Irrationally low because they do not conform to the cost imposed on the environment of having those gas prices. But ga the price of gas has become a fairly good indicator of which party is going to win national elections. So if you want to have a government that is elected and elections depend on votes, people will ignore the 
fine environmental arguments about the price of gasoline because they will never win the elections otherwise. And they will sooner, to go back to a previous question, invest a lot of money in the search for an alternative fuel like hydrogen, so nobody ever, ever, ever again will have to worry about gas prices, and therefore they will pay for scholarships for people not to be studying environmental law, but to be developing hydrogen-based fuels for airplanes. I mean, there are a lot of vicious circles and vicious dynamics in here, but I think one of the things we've been talking about is how does one change from vicious circles to virtuous cy circles or cycles. I don't think any of us can claim to have any monopoly on the good, but at least finding alternatives to the way things are is one place to begin. If your thing is about ignoring numbers, then I think there are things that a person like you might do by asking, well, where, are, where exactly are numbers being ignored? How can you make those numbers more relevant? Again, maybe I'll just conclude with one little example. In America, as you know, another great irrationality is why we have more guns than people, and then why we have mass shootings more than any other country. I mean, no well-to-do country has that high a uh, rate of, of gun deaths, and yet America seems to you know, roll along not doing anything. A few years ago, there was a shooting in a high school called Parkland, and the survivors of that school uh, launched a movement. And one of the students who was a survivor took a class with us uh, on numbers and their problems. But this kid, who had survived a traumatic experience, was absolutely convinced that if you could p persuade people about the numbers, that all these people are dying because of the numbers of guns, then the American public would change. And I don't think that even at Harvard I was able to get this young man to change his faith in the numbers. I don't think I was able to get him to understand that when somebody takes this weapon called an AR-45, I mean, excuse me if I'm wrong, I'm not a big expert on guns, but you know, this has become a sort of prized we weapon. I mean, people would sooner have that than a pet dog. And, you know, there's a famous picture of a, of a member of the U.S. Congress sending out a Christmas card with six people in the family cradling their guns. You know, so that's not about numbers. It's about people's understanding. It's about people's appreciation of things and about people's experience. And there's where you have to go to restore the humanity to the numbers. Ah, th thank you for a very provocative uh, kind of presentation. And uh, what struck me in particular was the use of visuals to explain the problem. And when I was looking at that logo, the S could very well be Bhargavi, and the G looks a bit like, like Leo. <laughs> but, if I were to interpret some of the visuals in your presentation, I was struck by one very uh, you know, striking kind of uh, imagery. You know, in the planetary, uh, those two parts of the planet you showed, it's very interesting that North America remains cool. And it's India, China, and Africa which are burning. Uh, and in your examples also, the examples you gave of Fukushima, TEPCO, Bhopal, they're all from this burning side of the planet. It always seems to feel that you know, nothing is wrong in North America. Uh, there's another image of Chipko, and I find it startling. It's, it's, a, it's an old image that the women are hugging the chill pine, and that chill pine is a disaster for the Himalayan ecology. Uh, there's an image of Narada, and all those women had gathered on the slogan of, uh, there will be no dam. And eventually, all the dams have been built. So you know, the contradictions in the imageries themselves, and given those contradictions, I'm 
just this is my question to you. What is the common ideological and political frame that is emerging? Is there one? So uh, on your very first point, um, long ago already, maybe even 30-ish years ago, I wrote an article about the prevalence of those earth images. And what I pointed out was that they were circulating very discrepantly between North and South. And I did a particular little quickie comparison in the year 2000 about the prevalence of that planetary image that f shows North America um, as compared with other ones. And the, the uh, most uh, circulating one actually shows the African continent and not North America. But it, it was already clear that when people picked out images from NASA's huge collection of these space shots, they picked for a purpose and that they foregrounded particular things that they wanted to show, and usually their own geographical domain was one of them. So, you know, the fact that images have politics behind them is standard fair, it's standard analytic ground in the field of science and technology studies. Um, if you're also asking about my choice of images, I'm not sure that there is anything particularly significant there. I mean, I do want people to I mean, you, you have an audience of people coming from all kinds of backgrounds. We know that images grab people more than text does, and having a lot of bullet points and, and dense text is probably not the best way to engage with people. So I try to take aesthetic images. Sometimes there's a purpose to them. So when I wanted the Fridays for Future images, I did take some trouble to find them from different parts of the world to make the point that this is not a movement that is localized in one place. But I think if you're asking a completely third question, which is, does do people, do analysts in the North typically depict the rest of the world in ways that exonerate their own and highlight others? I think there is some evidence to that effect. I mean, there, it, there is a little bit of work done on how um, the distribution of climate change impacts has come to be represented using what kinds of colors and what kinds of intensity of color, and that these have not been utterly neutral choices. And that, to some extent, the relative uh, safety or innocence of one place is signaled by a cool palette of colors, or maybe even shades of white and gray, whereas the more dangerous places are depicted in warm colors. But you know that starts to get itself into a domain of expertise that um, I'm not sure that you want to hear more about right now. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, so uh, this, the word that stuck with me through the presentation was compassionate resistance. And the thought, you know, it kind of, uh, it kind of crossed my mind, this thought about political engagement. Uh, I read about how being politically engaged is one of the most important things um, if you want to ensure a better, uh, you know, a better situation for climate justice and climate change. And um, I also volunteer with Fridays for Futures Karnataka chapter, and a lot of the work we do is resistance. We are always trying to um, kind of hold the people in power responsible and all that. And sometimes we think, you know, it would be better if um, young people get into politics so that our needs are better represented. And, um, you know, rather than being on this side of, uh, you know, this, the, this side of things, where we ask for um, leaders to do this or, you know, refuse, um, you know, don't do this, it would be better if we are in that position. But um, at least in India or around my peers, um, I don't see a lot of us considering it as a career or, you know, as something that um, a place for us to be and do some something about it. And um, I'm, I'm not sure about uh, other countries or other worlds. I mean, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Please, please bear with me. Uh, you know, other places. So, yeah, just wanted to hear your thoughts on this. 
I'm not sure that I understood exactly the question about. Uh, I, I was asking about um, the importance of political engagement and how um, p young people don't see it as a career, at least in this country. And um, yeah, uh, Bob, what do you well, think? I think that the situation in America has really changed. And uh, as with almost everything in the country right now, there's a kind of polarization even around the question of age. I mean, it's interesting that the last election at the presidential level had two of the oldest candidates ever facing off against each other, and Biden has just announced that he's going to run for re-election. At the same time, you're seeing much younger people going into politics, I mean, um, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was the youngest woman to be elected to the U.S. Congress, and, and people are in the, in the South in the last set of national elections, a couple of very young people were elected to the US Congress, people in their 20s. And even the, the anecdote I mentioned before about the Parkland shooting victims organizing, I mean, some of those people have discovered that, that their best way to try to influence anything is by getting elected. Um, we have in our neighboring city in Boston an extremely young woman mayor who's also the first Asian American mayor elected. So I think there is a generational shift, but it's a bimodal kind of distribution. I mean, you get the feeling that people between 40 and 60 are basically completely nuts. And, you know, it's the over 60s and the under 40s that, that the, the need to form an alliance of some sort. Um, that's probably not quite the same demographic distribution that you find in India, what's said about India is that India has a has a completely different um, demographic distribution from Western Europe, where it's very top heavy among the older people, and here the the sort of part of the hope of the country is said to be in the fact that there are many more youth that are capable of doing things, and then the worry is that they may not have jobs and may not have the bare sustenance to be able to get into a political career. But I think that um, it doesn't seem hopeless to me that out of these masses of younger people who do exist in this country, some would decide that there is, I mean, even if it's infantile rebellion against something that a lot of their elders have bought into and they don't have a theory of it, even if they're not animated as Bengalis of my time were by a particular political ideology, uh, nevertheless, I think just the sheer fatigue of seeing older people drone on and on might drive some of them into doing things in political action. I mean, if I were to endow something in ESG, I would do it for an internship program so that Pagavi and Leo and all of their coterie of friends can grab half a dozen people every year and try to, to brainwash them. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a question. Um, I just want, you know, Shaheen thankfully found the poem I was supposed to read out. Uh, and I think, in a way, it very beautifully, you know, responds uh, to what you have so, you know, profoundly spoken of. Um, and I, I would say it responds, you know, largely to what you, uh, what I would say, the universalism of what you called unruly, um, relentless resistance, and everyday resistance at that. So it speaks to that. So I'll just read out this poem. It's by Lisa Soher Majaj. She's a Palestinian poet, and like I said, it's a, it's called No. No, there's no poetry in it, but I need to say something about no. How it stands up, no matter how unpopular, in the face of injustice. Maybe it can't thwart history. The powerful have always known what they can do, and they do it. No can't stop an avalanche, but no could be a retaining wall, built of rough stones wrested from the earth carried one by one up the hill on someone's back. No might be a tree in the middle of a village street. Traffic shifts to flow around it. Its presence a reminder of what used to be, 
won't, what won't be forgotten. No is the perimeter of stubborn cactus springing up around destroyed villages. You can bulldoze, you can bulldoze houses, evict or kill the inhabitants, but the thorns of memory can't be eliminated. No is steadfast. It knows what it's like to have nothing in its hands but dignity. I would like to request Amrita Menon to kindly honor our guests with our ESG goodie bag. Has a lot of our merchandise with the new logo on it. Can we please have, please have Mr. Leo Saldana for the closing remarks? So, uh, you see this special logo here? So, this represents, like you all know, Earth. But it's also a congruence, equivalence symbol. And it's equal to, this is made with iron, but it's greenwashed. <laughs> and this is made with it's a globe and blue and but it's made with when you order a geo something it comes with a blue bag this is the garbage <laughs> and then these are all the inclusion of all the companies that ESG has fought you can see all the caps here that is the inclusion we are talking about. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dinesh, for that lovely interpretation. <laughs> it's late, and I know I shouldn't take much time, but it would not be fair if I couldn't thank profusely Professor Sheila Jesenoff for having made it across the world to be with us today. And believe it or not, day before yesterday, she was traveling from Boston to Delhi. Yesterday, she was giving a lecture, and I'm sure it was as engaging as it is today. And then last night, we were texting, and she was asking me questions, and I was responding, and the time was only 12 o'clock. And this morning, she woke up, and she took an early morning flight. So last night, I remember asking her, do, don't you sleep? <laughs> and she said, it's a waste of time. <laughs> or something to that effect. Now, you know, and tonight she's leaving at 3.30 in the morning back to Boston from Bangalore. So I don't know, hopefully we'll have a good flight and we'll sleep well. It's a long flight and I hope you don't have too many stopovers. But for us working with uh, Sheila has been... Uh, it's a meeting of a world of worlds which could never meet. And she comes from a position in which she has, she has contested power, though the institution itself is powerful. We know, for instance, that the struggle she has had to set up the Science and Democracy Network within that framework, which is named after John F. Kennedy, which in the Western world is a doyen and a symbol of democracy, but the struggles that there are in setting up the Science and Democracy Network in the Harvard Kennedy School is something to, you know, you can, you'll be overwhelmed when you listen to what Sheila's struggles have been there. And what she has done is essentially to go around the world and help people reimagine what it means to not lose hope. And to me that is, you know, fundamental. Because we live in an age where cynicism is almost everywhere. We're all quite happy with you know, saying how bad things are. But for me, the more important point is, how do we actually imagine in a way that we actually can see that there's so much possibility? And today's lecture to me was actually uh, the universalism of possibilities. Uh, it was not simply. Uh, something that was meant to provoke us, but actually it was uh, a message that, you know, it's not about chasing hope, but to, to live in hope and to be in hope with each other and to hold each other's hands with hope 
is perhaps the most powerful energy that there is on this planet. And I am sure that that energy is going to overwhelm all the darkness that is there and, you know, the kind of struggles we are having and the, you know, the, the, the specter of climate change uh, and its horrendous implications, all of that. Uh, so I wake up every morning uh, thinking, okay, uh, there's going to be bad news. Like today you saw some bomb went off and so many soldiers died. Uh, but I also wake up to say, okay, what is it that we can do today that will perhaps make tomorrow more interesting, right? So, and I'm, I must say that I, we have been happy to be uh, associated with Sheila and her team, and she has pulled together during the darkness of COVID pandemic. She did the most magical thing. She pulled together people from Australia all the way to the other side of the planet, if you want to think of the planet as flat. And there were conferences we had in which she would we would get up in, you know, our turn came somewhere around late night. But the people in Australia, I don't know when they woke up. I remember a person from Japan, for instance, who had to get up at some ungodly hour, some two o'clock. So the rest of us could have some rational sense of, okay, uh, we are within the span of sensible time. But there are 50 countries. And the COVID report that is going on, uh, it's, it's, it's really a critique of how we responded as humanity. Yes, our governments did things, and we did things, and we hid away, and somebody you know, did crazy things and all that. But the point is, finally, here was an example. Here was a moment in human history where the world could have done magic and brought humanism right out there. And did we do that? That was the question. And one of the prescient moments for me in that study was when Sheila gave a kind of a lecture uh, when all the inputs came in, uh, interestingly funded by the Eric Smith Foundation, uh, one of the founders of Google. Google. Uh, and she said there has never been a playbook, and everyone was looking for a playbook. So today, what I got from your lecture, Sheila, is that you again reminded us that you know to be unruly, like Dinesh was just now, is actually a being alive. And we're not searching for survival. We want to be alive. We want to live. And this is the whole gift we have got on this planet. And I really thank you for that message. I really appreciate that you made time for us and you came all the way. And uh, I'm sure that you have inspired so many others who have joined us. Many, many more have joined us online. Uh, so I, I, I really uh, wish you a safe and uh, uh, you know sleepy flight back home <laughs> so that when you get back to Boston, it's it's nice and springtime there, and so you, you can enjoy it there. And I must say that I really, really thank uh, Aditya Sondi, uh, who has been a friend outside of the court, but inside we fought bitter wars. But actually, he was on the right side of the opposite side. He was representing the National Biodiversity Authority, and we were fighting Monsanto. Uh, so, in fact, National Biodiversity Authority supported our cause in the first major criminal action against Monsanto, perhaps the only criminal action against Monsanto globally. It's now subject of a new book called Seed Activism, which has been published by MIT Press. It's a book written by Kareen Elaine Peshard. And when we started this, we didn't realize that we would actually be fighting with the man we met outside, Jairam Ramesh, where Bhargavi and I were standing in the public hearing with thousands of other people. And I can still go back to that time and hear Bhargavi screaming at him and say, you're not letting me speak. And it was not like he didn't want to let her speak, but it was like so crowded. And Mr. Devagoda, the former prime minister, turned up to that public hearing as just an ordinary person, as did Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anant, uh, Anant Murthy, who had come straight from his dialysis. He didn't even go home. And to me, that gave hope that we are at a moment of history where there's a man who is a minister of environment who has the power to decide what we eat. And we have to use that power and reshape the future. So today when we stand in 2023, and I look back at that public hearing in 2010, the kind of unruly behavior that was there, which was productive energy, which was shouting out the truth against the morass of the corporate state industrial complex. And the fact that truth eventually triumphed. And even to this day, we are eating brinjal, which was the first GMO they wanted to push into our throats. 
Kind of, yeah. My point is that it is in moments like this that we can actually uh, inspire ourselves. For me, this has been an energetic moment, and I thank you for that. I thank Aditya for making time. I'm quite happy with the fact that I got to meet Justice Krishna Bhatt. He has just retired from the High Court. And you know, the kind of memories that come back when he looks back at the Kojentrik struggle as a moment of our history. If Kojentrik had succeeded, Karnataka as economy would have collapsed. And it's to his credit that he could bring it out. Arun Agarwal is not with us, but he exposed the corruption. But if you see subsequently the type of energy dynamics that are taking place, it's any politics of energy that is going on currently, for instance, the way the Eidenberg report has revealed it, if, if only what we saw in 1999 was seen by everybody, the Eidenberg report would, was unnecessary because that's such a monster company would never have been created to completely capture the politics of this country and take it in a direction which we are fighting today. So I think small groups matter, small voices matter, and I quite, quite uh, you know, I'm quite grateful that uh, Madhu actually brought up the fact that we are only human. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you know, <laughs> what can we be? Chat GPT, we are not. We'll never be. Uh, but there are colleagues who want to, you know, when we say, let's write this, they just come up with like, I said, how did you do that? You know, and I said, oh, it's not bad. You can write dumb, boring stuff with Chat GPT, right? But today's was not Chat GPT. Today's was from the art, and I really appreciate the whole thing. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for this. And I would uh, uh, I mean, request all of you to come again tomorrow for the conversations. So thank you very much and have a good night.